This is Robert Kraft, and I'm coming to you live on SNN Live, and we're here at the ninth annual LD Micro main event in Bel Air, California. With me right now is Leslie Boscor from Electrum Partners, Inc., and we're going to be doing a Wall Street View. Leslie, welcome to the program. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. So before we get started and, you know, talking about a few topics, you know, what's your background and uh, tell me about Electrum Partners. So um, my background is in corporate finance and investment banking going back to the mid to late 90s, really, when I was one of the first investment bankers to focus exclusively on the internet and new media. Uh, that led me to realizing what I was most interested in is disruptive business models and trends that fundamentally change the way we live and do business on a massive scale. Because of that, I ended up looking into a number of different industries, and they brought me out to Las Vegas, which is where I ultimately ended up moving to after being in New York for 45 years. When I got there, I saw that there was something happening with the cannabis industry, that there was the beginnings of a legal cannabis industry. This was 2010. I read some of the laws, I did some research, and I had a friend by the name of Joe Bresney that said to me there were some big things happening and I should pay attention. I didn't believe him, I thought he was wrong, and then the election of 2012 happened, and Colorado and Washington made adult use marijuana legal for the first time since prohibition. That was when I decided to take a deep dive and focus on nothing but that. I unwound all of my other business interests and focused exclusively on the legal cannabis industry. Uh, and at first what I did was get involved on the policy side in advising the state of Nevada on its regulatory framework and working with policymakers to establish a good regulatory framework in Nevada. That led me to understanding what has become the mission for Electrum, which is creating good markets, creating the winners in those markets, and owning the winners, which is what we're focused on currently with Electrum Partners. That's an advisory firm, and we are also setting up uh, a, 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 an entity that's going to be an investing entity that should be deploying capital in the first quarter of next year. Okay, so we just had a you know a small little news event that <laughs> just happened. You may have seen it. You know we have a new president. Talk to me. How does that potentially affect the cannabis industry? Well, uh, the way it affects it most interestingly is it's giving some people pause. They're concerned about Jeff Sessions. They're concerned about representative price in health and human services. Uh, and they are wondering if the Trump administration is going to stay true to the statements about states' rights. And for me, that's fantastic. The more people that get paused from coming in because of that concern, the more there is for the people that are willing to work in this industry now to make. The truth of the matter is, I am certain that the gold is out of the mine already. There's no way to put it back in. And this is something that's moving ahead. It doesn't mean the battle's over. It means that we need to keep focusing on the future, having operators that operate at the highest standards, that we're establishing new businesses that use best practices and incorporate best of breed and best in class models in the industry. And if we do that, what we'll see is that this, if anything, is just a delay before we see the drop of federal prohibition sometime in five to seven years. So to recap, I believe that it's a major issue and that the issue is really in that it's going to keep some of the people who are a little bit more timid out and that it's going to mean more for the people that are willing to be in now. And there's going to certainly be a tremendous amount of money being made and a tremendous amount of opportunity. And to just give a little bit of context, we had eight states in an unprecedented fashion approve ballot initiatives. In the state of Nevada, including, yes, including California and Nevada, which is where I live now. So now that is, to give some context, the state of Nevada spent about $400 million, all the people in the, in the state, in building out the infrastructure for a medical marijuana market only. We now have the state of California with regulations for medical marijuana for the first time since they passed it in 96. We have adult use passed in California. We have the state of Hawaii building out its infrastructure for the licenses they gave out. We have the licenses being given out in Maryland. We have the state of Pennsylvania that passed medical marijuana, developing its regs and about to issue licenses. The state of Ohio developing its regulations. The state of Florida with a robust medical marijuana market. The state of Nevada with an adult, adult use market. The state of Massachusetts with an adult use market the state of Maine with an adult use market, and the list goes on. 
you're talking what will, about what will probably be in excess of $20 billion being raised and invested in building out the infra infrastructure in all those markets across the country. So I have a, an interesting question to ask you because I'm really curious about it because, you know, I've talked to a few of my fellow Californians, some that didn't vote for it to go through. And one of their big points was, well, look, if we vote for it to go through, you know, all these small growers who are just getting fined and arrested throughout their all their careers for doing something that's now potentially legal and for it to be legalized and then the corporations to come in, the bigger corporations to come in and take over, you know, I don't I might not necessarily want that. You know what what's your comment on that? It's a great question. And I'll tell you the first thing, let's go backwards from your your points. Sure. The first thing is that I want to make sure to set some context. Sure. Having big business come in will not happen until the drop of federal prohibition. The Altrias, the InBevs, the CVSs, the Conagras, the other large players, Pfizer, Merck, etc. They're not going to come in until federal prohibition drops and they know they can come into an open playing field with, with federal legality. So we have at least four to five, maybe six more years before that will happen. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I'm a big fan of small business. I believe in buy American, buy local. I'm a big, I, I'm a supporter of that. That being said, many of these small growers have not been adhering to good standards. They've not been adhering to best practices. They're not testing their product. They're using pesticides that were never meant for ingestion into the lungs. They're using herbicides and fungicides that were never meant for ingestion into the lungs. They are not testing for mold, mildew, and other biological contamination. What we're seeing with the advent of regulation is the establishment of a market we can finally trust as consumers, knowing that the small business and big business alike has to do it to certain standards, that they've got to meet standards of of cultivation, of processing, of purity, of potency, of labeling, of process, of seed to sale tracking. What we're essentially doing is creating a market that's going to weed out, if you'll pardon the pun, all of the operators who have not been willing to uh, uh, work on that high standard of best practices to be able to do things the right way. So I do understand the concern. The small business person will still be there like they are across the country. And at the same time, we will also see the establishment of regulation that creates a market that's much more trustworthy for the consumer. So another question I had too, and, and you brought this up a couple times, and that has to do with the dropping of the federal prohibition. You're saying it's like a five to six year range. Where do you kind of, where do you get that number? And has there been any guidance as to when they're going to potentially do this rescheduling? There's been no guidance other than from me and other people like me who, who look at the industry. And our opinions are based upon tracking the trends. Currently, cannabis was polling at about recently at 60% across the country for full legalization. We now have a conservative administration that has uh, conservative members like Jeff Sessions uh, that will be involved in determining policy. For four years, we're not going to see a lot of forward movement. At the end of that four years, we're going to see another presidential election. You're going to see 10, 15 states on the ballot that year for adult use and, and, and medical. At that point, we're probably going to see in, in November of 2020, I'm predicting that over 50% of the United States will have adult use available after that election. At that point, it just becomes an administrative step to take that step and to see that finally our elected officials are following the will of the people. And it's only going to take them six to eight years to be able to catch up. So another big issue that comes up when it comes to legalization that I've, I've always been kind of curious as to how they're going to, you know, set the regulations for that. And that comes with, you know, the equivalent to DUIs, you know, driving under the influence, you know, with alcohol. You know, what, from what you've seen, how are they potentially going to address this issue? Because I've, I've seen some in some places, you know, or in some articles that in Colorado, there have been incidences of driving while impaired. You know, so what, can you comment as to how they're hoping to regulate this? Yeah, so let me separate, separate it into a couple of different sections. First off, what you bring, it, bring up is really one of the key things, and that is not driving under the 
influence in striving while impaired. So let's start off with a level set. According to the National Transportation Safety Board, there has been at this point no discernible proof that cannabis leads to impairment that results in accidents. They've done a substantial test. No uh, proof that is able to clearly determine that cannabis' impairment like, is like alcohol in causing impairment of reaction time and driving uh, uh, pattern to lead to accidents. So first off, that was a, a study that was done in 2016, or the data was collected in 2016. Second, the current laws in most states, like in Nevada, are so draconian that if you used cannabis and a week later you got into an accident and you were tested, you would test positive as though you were impaired when you obviously are not. It was a week ago. So what we need to do is we need to see sensible laws, sensible regulation based on fact and data that determines how do you measure someone's impairment from cannabis and then we have to have testing for it, which is critical because I don't want to be on the road with people that are impaired and I don't want to find myself on the wrong side of that. I don't want my children or anyone to be exposed to that. That being said, the main issues are now one of creating the mechanisms to be able to do that and then being able to make sure that there is a, a universal way of measuring it. So for, for my last question, you know, what I want to know is you know, for our investor audience, when it comes to marijuana and cannabis, what are some of the things that they should be looking out for or that you, from your perspective, is kind of interesting you know, for the next year? So they should be doing their due diligence and paying attention to the companies that they look to invest in. They should be, if they're looking at private investments, they should be talking to groups like, or, or joining the ArcView group if they're accredited investors. If they're looking to invest and they really want to find a path to it, there are a number of public companies that are really worth looking at currently, although there weren't up until recently. Kush Bottles, KSHB, which I do not own any of, but I really like, was mentioned recently in a Cowan & Company report. Mass Roots, I saw Isaac uh, Dietrich walking around here. Uh, they are a well-run public company. Full disclosure, I have a small amount of options in Mass Roots. Uh, Terratech, TRTC, Derek Peterson, I don't own any of that. I'm a big fan of what they've been doing, and it is one of the most well-run public companies in the cannabis industry. Uh, I'm on the board of the company and have a position in GrowBlock Sciences, GBLX, that I'm also a big fan of. And I expect to see more and more companies become publicly traded out of the cannabis industry. And the wonderful thing about that is the transparency, and the ability to do your due diligence. And as we see more of them, we'll start to see a lot more attention being paid to the sector. I expect by this time, four years from now, there'll be hundreds of public companies, including now there's that one that just started trading on the New York Stock Exchange in the last week. Um, uh, I believe the IPO, that's the first cannabis REIT. Right. And so we're going to see more and more activity like that. So as an investor, um, look, deciding do I want to invest in private companies? If so, I join groups like the ArcView Network. And if I'm looking at public companies, do your due diligence, pay attention, make sure you're, you're not going and, and looking at companies that are not fully reporting, that don't have real assets. Look for the best of breed in the industry. And if you do that, you'll probably do very well. So where can our audience go and find more information about you and your, your contributions, your writings? Talk to me. So I, um, you can go to my website, www.electrumpartners.com. You can find me on Twitter at Leslie Boscor, L-E-S-L-I-E-B-O-C-S-K-O-R. And I have written something for uh, your publication, and I also have a monthly column on civilized.life which I write about the convergence of the cannabis industry and finance. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for the conference that you put on in Las Vegas. And I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. My name is Robert Kraft, and I'm coming to you live on SNN Live. And we're here at the ninth annual LD Micro Main Event in Bel Air, California. With me again is Leslie Boscor from Electrum Partners, Inc. Thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Robert. Really great to see you.